This week on Q&A, a look at the history and training of the Navy SEALs. Our guest is Dick Couch, a former Navy SEAL and author of many books, including The Sheriff of Ramadi. Dick Couch, what is a SEAL? Well, a SEAL is uh, a member of our special operations community. The SEALs stands for Sea Air Land, and they're maritime proponent of our special operators. Uh, they're home-based in Coronado, California, and in Little Creek, Virginia. And uh, as you probably know, they came from the frogmen of World War II, and they've evolved through times of Vietnam right on up to the present as maritime commandos. When were you a SEAL? Okay, I was on active duty from uh, 67, but I was in the SEAL program from 68 through 72 on active duty. Doing what? Well, I, primarily then it was all Vietnam, so most of our deployments then were to Vietnam, and uh, just like the deployments today for SEALs are mostly in Afghanistan, ours were into, uh, into Vietnam. Were you an officer? Yes, I was. And as an officer, what were your responsibilities? I was a platoon leader. Uh, I had an assistant platoon leader, and I had 12... Uh, I was privileged to lead 12 uh, fine young Navy SEALs, and uh, we primarily did direct action missions against the Viet Cong infrastructure in, in Vietnam. If I count right, you have at least 12 books you've written. Uh, actually, it's 14. Right? 14, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. How many of those are novels? Uh, I got to think about this. Uh, six of them, seven of them are novels. And the rest? Are nonfiction. And they relate to Navy SEALs, but also. Uh, I've written on Army Special Forces, and I just completed a book on the training of, of Army Rangers for the 75th Ranger Regiment. How long have you been writing the story of the SEALs? <clears throat> I, my first book, SEAL Team One, was a novel. It came out in 1990. Why did you do it? Well, I think that uh, as a, uh, you get to be middle-aged, you realize that things that you used to do, you're not going to do anymore. And I thought, well, gosh, it might be fun if I could write about them. So uh, I thought about writing a, a spy book since I'd spent some time at CIA, and then I picked up a book that was supposedly written by a Navy SEAL, but it wasn't. It was about the Riverine forces, so I called the editor. They said, well, we're really hungry for books on Navy SEALs, and I said, well, that settles that one. So I wrote a book called SEAL Team One, and the rest is, uh, is history. Where do you live now? I live in Ketchum, Idaho. And how long were you in the Navy? Uh, I was only on active duty five years, but I did do 30 years as a reservist. And being in the Navy Reserves associated with the SEAL program kept me current with what was going on within that community. And your final rank? I retired as a captain in the Navy Reserves. I want to show you a picture, and this is, you can find this all over the web. Is that what a SEAL team looks like? Well, I think those are our SEAL trainees, but yes, that's pretty much what they look like. They're very robust, healthy young men who uh, uh, and, and probably starting out and hopefully on a long and, and uh, safe and productive uh, career as a Navy SEAL. Now, we're going to show you the rest of this picture, uh, which includes somebody that people will be familiar with. This was taken back in 2009 at Coronado. Mm -hmm. That's the Vice President of the United States. Right. How often do politicians, in your experience, visit operations like the SEALs? Well, uh, back in 1968, I didn't see any politicians during my training, but I think periodically now and then they do come through there. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, there are classes that go through that never see any politicians, but occasionally uh, somebody, you know, of, of that stature comes through and wants to, to, to see what's going on, and so they let them go out and view training. Before we go any farther, I want to make sure I correct. I said Dick Coach. It's Dick Couch. That's it. Yes, sir. What kind of a name is that, by the way? Sir, I have no idea. I'm an American, and I, it's an American name. I, don't, I think it may have some English-Scottish ancestry, but I'm not real sure. What was your reaction when you heard that the SEAL Team, <clears throat> and I want to ask you about the name of it because <clears throat> I understand it's not SEAL Team 6, really, but the SEAL Team had killed Osama bin Laden? Well, at first we, you know, I heard, uh, I happened to be in California at the time, my wife were taking a walk and somebody stopped and said, you know, they've got bin Laden. They killed bin Laden. They've got him and they've got his body. And I thought, me, like, well, where did it happen? And how did it happen? And come to find out it was a special operations component. And then as the news came in, it was a cross-border operation into Pakistan. 
And then we learned that we started hearing a lot about Navy SEALs. Uh, I'm not so sure where that came from. I, I rather think it didn't come from the Department of Defense. But pretty soon we were t had a steady diet of Navy SEALs, sophisticated operation into Pakistan, and that they had killed and bin Laden and brought out his body. What does it mean, special operations? Well, the special operations, uh, this country's blessed with a very robust special operations presence, both Army, Navy, Air, our, our special operations airmen, and special operations Marines. And they have a lot of different capabilities from strategic reconnaissance, counterinsurgency, foreign internal defense, intelligence collection. They do an awful lot of things. One of the things, of course, the, that they do and this is the one we focus on, are the direct action operations. And those are the combat assaults like this, this one was, where they, a small unit uh, comes in uh, with the element of surprise, violence of action, and takes down a, a target. So if, how many of the, do, do, I know you've looked at this, how many <clears throat> SEALs were involved from what you can tell? You know, I really don't know. I hear the number of 20-some or 30-some or what have you. It would be my uh, estimate that there were, prob there were some SEALs there, but there were probably a lot of non-SEALs on that target. Uh, intelligence specialists, security specialists, uh, people that are there to exploit the intelligence that might be taking place. Uh, I think there was probably an integrated team that took down that compound, but as we understand it, uh, a lot of them were Navy SEALs. This outfit is not called SEAL Team 6, it's called Dev Gru. Well, I really don't talk about these things. Within our special operations posture, uh, a lot of these units are, have broad general capabilities, but some of them are special units that focus on certain capabilities, and they spend all their time doing one thing, and they can do it very well. In this case, the team that went in there was specialized on combat assault, and that was the team that went in. Uh, you know, you can get on Wikipedia, right. and all this stuff is on there. Uh, Naval Special Warfare Development Group right. used to be called SEAL Team 6, supposedly started in 1980-81 with the whole uh, Iran rescue attempt of the hostages right. uh, by a guy named Richard Marchenko. Mm -hmm. who, do you know him? Yes. He was, what, same thing as you were? Was special? He, he was of my era SEAL, yes. Why, why is, what, what's secret about the, the, you know, what are you told, because you've been a part of all this and right. written about this, you can't tell. I think that what it is is they like to maintain, even within our non-secret non elements, a certain amount of anonymity. Uh, these men go out, they risk their lives, they have a, a high profile, especially in a mission like this, and they like to come home to their families and their communities and be able to integrate back into society without having the notoriety that might accompany this type of thing. So that's why that there's a lot of security and considerations around this. And also some of their training, some of their specialties, their communication skills, their tactics and procedures, all of these things they like to keep very closely held. So they put these units off limits to a lot of people, including people like myself, just to sort of protect their uh, the way they go about their business and to protect their, their, their identities as well. A television station down in West Palm Beach, WPTV, has a report on the website of the museum, the mm -hmm. SEAL Museum. Have you ever been there? Yes, I have. So is that run by the Navy? No, that's run by, uh, that's an independent uh, UDT SEAL Museum uh, commemorated where the first frogmen trained and they have a lot of memorabilia there. I can get that out. And uh, it's just, uh, it's an uh, independently financed organization. We're going to run, the, it's about a two minute and a half report oh, that the, uh, the Channel 9 down there had on, I think it was like May 2nd, uh -huh. just to give a sense of what, how they looked at it down there right after this happened. Keep the details locked and sealed. It's what Navy SEALs are being told to do after the highly trained special operations group killed bin Laden. The operation was carried out by a unit known as SEAL Team 6, and they're known as the best of the best. The group had been reportedly training in Afghanistan for the mission for a month. But it takes longer than a month or even a year to become a Navy SEAL. 
The super soldiers are trained to the highest standards and are considered to be some of the most fearsome fighting forces in the world. News Channel 5's Carolyn Schofield joins us live from Fort Pierce, where the Navy SEALs got their start decades ago. Carolyn? Kelly, right here from 1943 to 1946, a special group of men trained to go into the most dangerous situations. The frogmen paved the way for the Navy SEALs, and that history is celebrated here. Executive Director Mike Howard opened the front gate today, even though the Navy SEAL Museum is closed on Mondays. People wanted to stop by, walk around, and reflect. Someone placed a bouquet below the memorial, underneath the 55 names of Navy SEALs who died fighting in Desert Storm and the War on Terror. People have been driving up just out of the blue wanting to, to thank SEALs for this, and it's just been been tremendous outpouring of patriotism and thanks. This museum honors the long, proud history of the Navy SEALs. That history began here on Hutchinson Island during World War II. About 3,500 frogmen trained to clear obstacles off beaches in Normandy. The frogmen evolved into the Navy SEALs, and nearly 70 years later, SEAL Team 6 killed Osama bin Laden. I think all SEALs are, former SEALs are proud of, of that fact, and uh, uh, we're fortunate that they, you know, the SEALs could be, be part of that and uh, uh, puts on notice a lot of other bad guys out there that we're coming after you and, and uh, you're not going to hide, you know, so stand by. There have been other successful missions in recent history. Somali pirates held the captain of the Maersk, Alabama hostage on this lifeboat in 2009. Three bullets fired by Navy SEAL guns shattered the windows and simultaneously killed all three pirates. Now the museum is planning a display for this latest show of force. And we're already at work trying to get some artifacts, uh, some things about the operation. It may take some time, uh, but uh, we're optimistic we'll have some things. And the museum will be open from 10 to 4 tomorrow. Congressman Tom Re Rooney recently introduced a bill that would make the memorial here the official National Navy SEAL Memorial. There is a lot of pride for those military men here. Reporting live at Fort Pierce, Carolyn Schofield, WPTV News Channel 5. Were you surprised when you heard the number 55 had died over in Iraq? Uh, no, I wasn't. I've watched these casualty figures mount, and it's an un, you know it's, we've been at this for 10 years. I believe 43 is the number that we lost in Vietnam. So uh, with a much smaller force, by the way. So uh, no, I was not surprised. I knew we were we were in, in the 50s someplace. I understand from reading that this group that went in to Pakistan to get Osama bin Laden, that group is higher trained than the average SEAL. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they've more it, the the group that went in there is more specially trained for that particular mission. I think a lot we have a lot of special operations components uh, that could have handled that mission. It could be that this team was selected because of their availability. They could have been area specialized, but I think it's because they had expertise in this particular mission, so they were selected to go and do that. How many seals are there? Uh, there's a little over two thousand, maybe twenty two hundred active duty Navy SEALs and that's not all those are guys, young guys with guns. You've got your, you know, your higher up staffing function, command and com control and what have you. What's the average age from your experience? Uh, the average age of a deploying SEAL platoon is probably around 28, 29 years old. So if a SEAL enlisted man were to go into this uh, mission, uh, what kind of training would they have gone through to get there? Well, it's, it's quite a journey. Uh, he'll sign up to be a sailor. He'll go to boot camp. Uh, he, his A school will be BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training, and that and associated schools will take him approximately six months. Then, where, where will it be? It will be in Coronado, California. Then he'll immediately go to airborne school, and then he'll go into SEAL qualification training. That's what really qualifies him to wear the Trident and to, to qualify him as a Navy SEAL. That's about, about another six months. So you've got a year's training in after boot camp until this young man is a qualified Navy SEAL. Then he will go to a SEAL team and he will train with his new SEAL platoon for as much as 18 months before he goes on operational deployment. So it's a two and a half year process 
to make uh, a, a, a combat capable Navy SEAL. There's the symbol on the screen Correct. of the Navy SEAL. Is there a pin that you get when you become a SEAL? That's it. Right that, there. That is the pin that you wear. Uh, it's called the Trident. Uh, it came about, I think, probably around 1972, 73. That was adopted as the uh, emblem of the Navy SEALs. Now, if you don't mind, I'll characterize you as not a large person. I think that's uh, that's an accurate characterization. How tall are you? Uh, five nine. And what is the average height of a SEAL team member? And uh, you're not very big either. They seem to be making them bigger nowadays. I notice a lot of these young men seem to be more robust, a lot of upper body strength. They seem to be bigger than they were in my day, but then everybody's bigger nowadays than they used to be. Uh, I've always felt, and I think it's still true, that the SEAL training, the rigorousness of SEAL training is almost a little man's game. You know, you have to be able to drag your body around all those obstacles and all those runs and swims and what have you. And sometimes being a smaller man uh, is to your advantage. And the Navy has a lot of pictures you can find on their website. One of them we're going to see right now, which is uh, somewhere up in Alaska, I believe. Uh, is this glamorizing what a SEAL is? team member is some of the shots that you're going to see? I don't think so. The training in Alaska, uh, that's part of SEAL qualification training and they're up there in cold water coming out of that cold water across the beach and up into the mountains. So it's very rigorous training to prepare them for uh, what SEALs often are asked to do and that's come from the sea. Here's a student that you said would be going through the buds uh, on the screen there, that basic underwater demolition SEAL. Exactly. Uh, yes. What that stands for. Uh, what's the toughest part of this? Well, I think the tough part, toughest part, and we focus on that, and that's Hell Week. You have about five to six days of continuous training with maybe a total of four to four and a half hours of prescribed sleep during that process. So it's, uh, it's physically difficult, but it's a mental challenge to keep yourself going, to stay focused, keep your eyes on the goal of getting through this uh, and to come out the other side. Just had a helicopter and now you have a uh, young fellow jumping out. Are they all men, by the way? They are all men. Uh, there are no women in, in any of our ground combat uh, components, uh, Marine infantry, Army infantry, and SEALs. What's that, you know? Okay, that he's climbing a scaling ladder probably up the side of a ship, uh, you know, shipboarding. It's a maritime operation coming from the sea over the side of a ship and uh, to board it and uh, 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 conduct an operation aboard that ship. Is the training any different today than it was when you were in <clears throat> Vietnam? Uh, it is It is different and it's not different. Some of the same requirements. Hell Week was started by Admiral by Draper Kaufman who founded the Navy SEALs back in 1943. We still have a Hell Week today. Some of the evolutions, the physical training, the challenges there are much the same. I think that, dur but during the under the training in the in water training aspects, the land warfare aspects have been greatly elevated, updated, and there's a lot more. Once they get through the physical rendering of who has the heart to do this business, then I think there's a much more uh, dedicated focus on and refinement on teaching them military sk skills that they're going to need. How accurate is this? The statistic that I read that 80% of the people that come into the SEALs don't graduate. Uh, that's very accurate. It's also about the same number that tr that comes into our 75th Ranger Regiment and our Army Special Forces, the Green Berets. They have similar attrition rates as do the Navy SEALs. And if you're not if you're knocked out, what's usually the reason? Well, it could be it. Uh, we we like the analogy that, or, and I think it holds true then and now that 10 to 15 percent of these young men will not quit. It's just not in them, and unless they get wounded injured, they'll get through training. And there's another 10 or 15 percent who don't have the physical equipment to go through this training. But the rest of them, it's whether they want it bad enough to do it, whether they have the mental toughness to get through this training. So uh, those who have that get through it. Those who don't will, f will be sent off, go off into the Navy and they'll find another way to serve their country. What's the ratio of enlisted men to officers? You know, I'm not too sure on that, but I think it's right around uh, 10 to 15 percent officers, the rest enlisted. Do the officers have any different training from the enlisted men? Uh, 
No, they go through the same initial training with the enlisted men side by side. They may branch off for separate leadership courses and there may be some additional things, but basically the training until they get to their actual SEAL teams is very much the same. The face of this particular event over in Pakistan seems to be uh, Vice Admiral William McG McGavron. McCraven. Boy, I'm having trouble with my, my, <laughs> my accuracy this time. Yes. McCraven. Tell, yes. tell us about him. Well, uh, Bill McCraven is, uh, a very, is a very intelligent and forward-looking officer. He, when he was commander of Naval Special Warfare Group 1 in Coronado, he brought in an awful lot of innovative things that helped link intelligence collection with operations. So this, this uh, uh, op intel fusion was sort of, uh, he contributed that a great deal and he's carried that forward. Uh, he's had some very responsible pos positions. He was commander, as, you, as, as, as is in the papers now, of the Joint Special Operations Command and he's recently been given, nominated for a fourth star and nominated to be commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command. In the article that was written in the Washington Post by uh, Craig Whitlock, it says here, the author of a textbook titled Spec Ops, the, the Admiral, yes, um, had long emphasized six key requirements for any successful mission. Surprise. What are you taught about surprise? Well, if you, you, wanna, you want to get there when they least expect you and their guards at the lowest, you get the uh, surprise, we, we, we break it down to two. There's element of surprise and violence of action. But basically, surprise, you want to get there when they don't expect you to come. And if it's rainy, it's a bad night, uh, good time to go on an operation. Another one is speed. I think that's, uh, yes, getting on target quickly, getting deployed, getting set up, and getting the job done. It's Were you surprised to read that the helicopters being used, or at least one of them, was stealth? That I was. I wasn't aware, and stealth is a broad term, whether this was uh, electronically stealthy or whether it, uh, you know, had some radar absorption, reflecting capabilities or what have you. I'm not just sure, but uh, it seems that there were some new technologies involved with this. Another of his six points was security. I'll, I'll name them. Security, simplicity, purpose, and repetition. Mm -hmm. Go to the repetition. I think repetition comes into battle drill. You have to practice. In other words, and sometimes uh, preparation can be it's, it's an intelligence. The intelligence is perishable. You have to move quickly. That means you're out the door. You grab your guns. You draw it up in the dirt. Get on the helicopter and go. But if you have the chance that you can practice and rehearse, uh, you do this you make good use of your rehearsal time and if you can do it and not only just for an operation but practicing your procedures and your techniques over and over again till you become very proficient at it. Uh, I have a saying in the military uh, if the amateurs do it amateurs do it over and over until they can get it right the professionals do it over and over till they can't get it wrong. How often do you one of the other ones as we say was simplicity but how often and we've got a picture of some of the SEAL team members this again comes from Navy not this exercise in Pakistan but practicing for going in and out of rooms and buildings uh -huh. how often do you think they practice before they went in there? Well they, they've practiced this for the last 10 years. Uh, they practice all the time in one form or another. Maybe not for this particular target, but they're constantly out practicing. If they've got a, a what we call a shoot house, they'll find the one and they'll practice entering rooms, opening doors, moving from room to room, from floor to floor, to, t to uh, assault in an urban situation, moving from building to building. They practice this day in and day out, week in and week out. Then when it comes down to focusing on an individual objective, if they have, as they appear to have had this time, some idea of where they were going, then they construct a facility and then they try to bring that practice in to where it's a little more relevant to the mission they're going to be going on. How much weight do they put on their bodies in way of equipment? Mm -hmm. It depends on a combat assault like this where they're, they're in and out. Uh, they're, they're very heavy. They're not taking food and water and things like this. They're he very heavy on weapons and ammunition and communications equipment. I would say 40 to 45 pounds is what they're carrying. And, they're, and their body armor, helmets, that type of thing. What kind of a weapon? Uh, they have a variety of weapons they use. I would think the standard special operations M4 rifle is what most of them use. Uh, they may have other weapons in the mix. There are, there are light 
squad assault weapons. Uh, there are heavier squad assault weapons that, have he that are of heavier caliber. Uh, they have a broad selection of weapons, but they're, they're rather standard throughout our special operations community. How much firepower does one individual have on them? Well, I'd say a, man, a rifleman going through theirs probably has his M4 rifle. Uh, it's associated with certain targeting devices for daytime and nighttime shooting. Uh, he's got his night observation devices. Uh, I can't imagine him going on this thing with less than four or 500 rounds of ammunition. And they're all automatic weapons? Yes, uh, very seldom do they fire on full automatic though. When you go on a mission like this, who's gonna know about it in your family? You know, I, that's a good question. I'm not real sure. I think that they try to, obviously you want to come home and say something more. Yes, I've been away for a couple months and I can't talk about anything. I think you have to share things with your family as it's appropriate with your spouse, uh, perhaps maybe not your extended family. But I think that you have to, uh, I know that even in, uh, when I was in CIA, some of the things were highly classified, but you shared things with your spouse. How long did you work for the CIA? Uh, I was there for four years. What years? Uh, I'm going to have to go back here and think. Uh, 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 73, 77. And what kind of work were you involved in that you can talk about? Uh, I was, uh, my title was Maritime Operations Officer. I did a variety of things, but I really can't go into it. And why, do, why are we so secret about something like this? What's the reason? Uh, I think that kind of as a general security blanket to keep these things from people who maybe don't need to know about them and having general security procedures. There's an awful lot of things that go on at CIA that are not classified. But I think having a general security policy that covers everything uh, is helpful for those situations where you really don't want to talk about it or you don't want anything out about it. What was your reaction to what was reported in the general press after this event? Well, it, we were getting information bled out. I, I find it, the, the, I think what a lot of people are asking questions, and it certainly bothers me, is, is how we had an operation, the basics of uh, special operations, Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, he was killed, the body was brought out. Those were sort of the basic facts of it. Then you started hearing things that, well, he was, he was armed. He resisted. His wife, uh, he used his wife for a shield and what have you. I can't imagine those coming out, those, that, that, uh, uh, those comments coming out of a military briefing. When these guys came back, they were briefed what happened, how, what, where, when, and why. And I think this administration would have been much better served to have put out the basics and then said, wait until you have all the facts in, all the stories, then come out with the details as appropriate as to what took place. And then you wouldn't have had this backtracking on various things that, that uh, seemed to flow out of the operation. There was a piece written in the Telegraph of uh, London, a newspaper, by a guy named Toby Young World, and it got a lot of attention. And the headline on it is, Jay Carney is floundering under pressure, say Washington Insiders, he's the spokesman for the president. But it was the last paragraph I wanted to read back to you, just to see what you think uh, of, I mean, this guy was harsh about uh, Jay Carney. He says, unless Carney is capable of raising his game, he needs to be thrown under a bus. President Obama is coming dangerously close to snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Somehow he and his press secretary have created the impression that Operation Geronimo was carried out by the Keystone cops rather than an elite unit of Navy SEALs. In fact, the only amateurs in this unfolding story are in the White House. Is that fair? I mean, do, have you had that feeling? Maybe not that strongly, but yes, I have. And I think that, you know, the communication from the debriefing room at the operational level up to the presidential level something happened there that was that was miscommunicated, mishandled, and should have been a whole lot done a whole lot better than it was. You know, you read the stories and every newspaper had a different story about it, mm -hmm. but somebody was feeding that the storyline, the back story on that. And did you ever get a sense of where it's did any of it sound like it came from the Pentagon from you? It didn't sound like it came from no, it didn't. It it didn't sound like it came from the Pentagon nor from the the operational end of this thing. I think when these guys come back off an operation, there's a very prescribed format to where they go through and debrief this, 
take notes on it uh, because uh, on any operation, but especially an operation like this, and I can't imagine these things spilling out like this in the format that they, they come out. So I don't know where the disconnect was, where the misinformation or what happened, but uh, uh, I think that after any special operations, they will go back and say, what could we, did we learn? Even a successful one, what did we learn? How can we do it better next time? That has to be going on within the White House and their uh, layers of communication. Supposedly, the SEALs came out of Afghanistan somewhere. And, um, <clears throat> and it, what can you tell us about what would be the normal setup time for something like this and the way of getting ready to go in there, whatever it was, midnight or whatever mm -hmm. time it was? Mm -hmm. How long are they in place? Who's talking to them to get them ready? How much tension is in their bodies? Yeah, well, it all depends on, you know, quite, this was not their first rodeo. These guys have all done this many, many times, and quite often they do it in a very compressed time frame because the intelligence comes down to them, it's perishable, and they have to act on it. This seemed to be something that it was a long-term target. They were tracking it. There was a, a, a more of a gradual buildup to it so that they could be highly briefed. Uh, they rehearsed in depth. So there was a, they, they had a lot of time to prepare for this one. I'm sure that when they, there, there may have even been some windows that they were hitting this window. Okay, we're not going to go now. We're going to hit the next window and the next window. So they may not have known quite when they were going. Uh, people that manage these operations have to make sure that they're ready to go, that they're fresh, that their sleep cycles are in order so that, so that they're going on target, you know, with their, at their optimum physical capabilities. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have to go on. Uh, I also would like to point out that whereas the SEALs are getting front and center on this, there was a huge team of people that put those guys on target from analysts to to briefers, to trainers, to and some very talented aviators that, that, that took them there. So uh, there was a lot went into this, and the SEALs are getting a lot of credit for it, but there was a whole huge team that put this together of which uh, the, to get these guys on target. From your experience, how much of what happened could have been seen on television in closed circuit? Do you mean? In other words, how much of the on-site event uh, could have been televised all the way back to Washington via satellite on a closed circuit uh, secure system. I tell you, I'm just guessing, but probably all of it. I think that uh, where they have these helmet cams, they have a lot of commun the communication capabilities are very robust. Uh, maybe not every bit of it, but I'm, we have a lot of capabilities in this area of communications and real time video and audio communication. So uh, I'm sure that there's a good deal of it that uh, is on tape and is being reviewed and and lessons learned from it. They did say there was a 25 minute gap. Somebody, when I say they, I'm not sure what, <laughs> you know, during the operation when there was no video contact. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that possibly could have been. Uh, they were in a foreign country. There's a, uh, there was a lot of, of, a lot of things going on and sometimes the links don't quite work. Even, the, even your regular radio sometimes, uh, you know, you have to jiggle it around to make it work. So. Uh, uh, I can see where they may have had better communications, but they were down for a period of time. When you look back on your own career and the SEALs, did you ever come, were you ever involved in a, a moment where you thought you might not live? Uh, yes, and they all kind of fade, but I remember one time I thought some friendly fire had, had my boat pretty well zeroed and the, 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 the racers were walking right up to us and the boat officer, a good friend of mine, managed to dive for the phone and yell ceasefire just in time to call that uh, gunner off. He would have had us. I was confident of that. And how much of what you did in Vietnam and as the SEALs can you talk about today? You know, pretty much all of it. It was a long time ago. There was, uh, uh, it was a lower tech type of, of engagement. Uh, there wasn't the transparency on the battlefield that there are today. So this was, uh, this was a long time ago. And our, oddly enough, some of the some of the mechanics of an operation. You have intelligence. We think there's a target here that's viable. We're going to do it. We study it. We get information on it. Then we brief. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's how we're going to get in. Here's, these are our actions on the target. Uh, this is how, what we'll do. This is our time frame. These are our support elements. Uh, this is how we're going to come off target. Uh, this is the time frames and what have you. It's pretty much right out of the Ranger handbook what we did back then and pretty much how they go about operations today. And uh, 
the article about uh, Vice Admiral McRaven, it said that uh, he's a guy that I, this is a quote, he's a guy that I think you can look at as a modern SEAL, a post-Vietnam era SEAL, guys that are quiet, humble, and smart. What's the, it, the humility thing? Are you taught mm -hmm. humility? Yes, sir. Well, they, that's brought up quite a bit, you know. Let your, your actions speak louder than words. Be a professional. We're the quiet professionals. Uh, I think that's the theme that's brought throughout the SEAL training, throughout their operational history. Uh, and the highest accolade that you can pay a Navy SEAL is you're very professional. They what can, what they, about quiet? Well, quiet, I think that... Uh, uh, within their own groups, they talk and they're boisterous and there's a culture there. But I don't think you need to be, uh, I think there's maybe in the past some tendency to go down and, uh, you know, uh, spend time in the bars and get a little rowdy and what have you. That has no place in modern special operations. Are there many college-educated SEALs that are enlisted? I think probably as many as half, perhaps more than half, are college-educated. And I mean with degrees, not just having been to college, but have college degrees. And they choose not to be an officer. Many of them have chosen not to be an officer. Uh, I find that also that's the same case in, within the Army Special Forces at Green Belays and the uh, 75th Ranger Regiment. A lot There's some very fine men who have college degrees have elected to be uh, a leader at the non-commissioned officer level. Let's go back to BUDS. Mm -hmm. Again, it means? Uh, basic Underwater Demolition SEAL Training. Done where? At Coronado. We've got some video to show SEAL team members either in training or, you know, obviously not, you can see it there. They're, here they are in the water, and uh, we have all different kinds of video showing them in different places. When you see this, does this remind you of what it was like when you were there? Uh, I think mine was far more cruder uh, I, uh, than, than what they go through right now. Uh, uh, here they are in the surf. These are, uh, uh, this is land warfare phase. They train at San Clemente Island for their uh, weapons training, their land warfare training. What kind of a weapon are they holding there? Uh, that's an M48 uh, uh, submachine gun. This is an older clip because uh, those are some dated weapons they're handling there. Do they tend to get the best weapons? Fastest? I think they do. I think they, they're, they're standard military weapons, but they tend to have uh, uh, some of the, the best ones. And uh, uh, when new ones come out, they tend to get them first. When they are being trained, what's the toughest part of the training? <clears throat> well, initially, I think the toughest part of the training is Hell Week, uh, the daily grind, week in, week out of this physical and mental grind. I think. But uh, it, during Hell Week, though, what's the roughest part of it? Oh, I think just staying up, being up for... Uh, uh, 48 hours without sleep, then getting an hour's sleep, then staying up another 24 hours. It's just, um, it's mentally very, very challenging. At what point do you remember people breaking the most during the Hell Week? In Hell Week, where you have five days where you get four hours sleep, everybody drops out in the first day because it's, anybody can do 24 hours, but the mental strain of saying, I've done 24 hours, I got four more days of this, I'm going to quit. So the real tough ones will say, well, okay, I did one day, I'll do another day, and I'll do another day. And the really good ones at the end of Hell Week, they'll say, I'll do this as long as you want because I'm going to be a Navy SEAL. What do you think, from your experience, and you've taught at the Naval Academy, what, what do you think a person has to have, I mean, other than the platitudes that we, you yeah. hear all the time, but what is, where do they learn to, to want to do this kind of stuff? Well, there's a whole bunch of things in the way of, uh, of character, maturity, physical, mental strength, and what have you. Uh, but I've been a student of special operations training, especially SEAL training here. And I, the thing, the common thread that runs through it are the young men who succeed or young men who have parents who had high expectations of them. Uh, they were not surprised to see the young men succeed in these programs because they had sort of programmed them to finish what they start, to do their best, and to, they, they have high expectations. And I found that to run, if any one trait runs through all these people, it's, uh, I hate, for want of a better term, good parenting. 
I, uh, I noticed in all the video we see in most of the film, you see almost no minorities. You see one or two, but most of them mm -hmm. are white boys. Yeah, that is an issue. I think it has to do with water skills. Within the seals, it's how many kids played in the swimming pool when they were growing up and how many played in the fire hydrant out in the street. Uh, you, those water skills almost have to be taught at a very young age to be comfortable in the water. A secondary thing is with a lot of uh, black men, uh, they have very dense muscle mass, so they're very negatively buoyant in the water. And this can be very challenging when you're asked to perform in the water uh, and they, they stress them in the pool. They tie their hands and feet together and they have to be able to uh, grab a bite of air and deal with that. And if you're very negatively buoyant, it does create challenges. Is it a, a, an issue that's talked about? Yes. I mean, how do we get more of these good black kids to come into BUDS and to get through BUDS? And it's the same in Army Special Forces and the same in our Ranger Regiment. Uh, we, we just don't have as many minorities as we would like. So you go back to this operation that killed Osama bin Laden. What kind of orders are given? I mean, how, how, before, so let me start with this. How soon before they take off would they have been told exactly what the mission is? You know, that's, I'm not sure. I think somewhere along, they're training for a mission. Uh, when it starts this much time and attention, everybody looks around and says, this is better be important, you know. And there's, there is one mission that's on the back of everybody's mind is, is getting the, the uh, public enemy number one. So at some point, they will be told, this is your mission. When they are briefed into the target and the mission, they're put in what's called isolation, where they, are, they don't have any communication with the outside. This is standard procedure. Uh, they're in isolation and they will stay in isolation until this mission goes or is canceled. So they won't be able to talk to they home? Talk to nobody, or... nobody. They are in, they are locked down. And what are you told about communicating with your family? Uh, I think you tell your family there's times when I will not be in communication because I could be on an operation. Uh, uh, if something's going to happen to me, somebody's going to contact you pers in person at the door. It's not going to be... Uh, so if you're not here, if I, you're not hearing from me, everything is okay. How much do the seals have to deal with post-traumatic syndrome? Uh, it is an issue. I think it's l almost less of an issue within our special operations components because they're involved in combat assault as opposed to the broad range of counterinsurgency work. I think it's very stressful to be a young army or marine trooper on patrol in Helmand Province, day after day, week after week, with the ambiguity of IEDs and somebody shooting at them and having to deal in among friendly populations and being very measured in their response. I think that's what creates a lot more stress than perhaps a high-risk operation like the one we see uh, with Osama bin Laden. This may sound like a strange question, but do SEALs ever get some kind of a relaxer, I mean, I don't want to use, you can use the word drugs, but I mean, are there any kind of a relaxer that's given to somebody about to go into combat because the stress is so high? I can't imagine that. I think it, anything would degrade from that. Uh, uh, I remember in Vietnam, we used to have these little dexedrine pills that if you'd been up a long time and you had to go on an operation, you could take one, but all they do is just screw you up. Uh, I can't imagine they're doing anything like this. Uh, I think that they try to keep their sleep cycles in, in proper rotation so that when they're awake and alert is the time that they're going to be going on this operation. When you go about selling your books and talking to audiences, what's the questions that are asked the most often? Uh, I think most of them revolve around training. What does it take to be a Navy SEAL? How do you go about it? Who are these people? How do they get into that? Why do young men become interested in this? Those are the, the, the general questions uh, and I tell them uh, I mean, I love Navy SEALs and I'm very proud of it, but we have a, a whole range of special operations components. So if a young man's looking to serve his country and wants to serve his country in special operations, he has a smorgasbord of organizations he can look at and decide which one uh, meets his capabilities best and how can he best serve his country. You get on Wikipedia, click in Navy SEALs, and they tell you that there are, I guess, 10 SEAL teams. Right and you number them odd for the West Coast, even for the East Coast. That's, that's kind of how it unfolded because back in, in my time, there was SEAL Team 1 was on the West Coast and 2 was on the East Coast, and that was it, 1 and 2. And now there are 10. Right. And then <clears throat> also there's a, a SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 1 and SEAL Delivery Vehicle Team 2. What do they do? 
they specialize in operations from uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, in other words, they will come out, they'll go someplace off a coast that is denied area perhaps, and they will come out from the parent submarine into a smaller submersible and, and conduct a mission from there. It could be harbor reconnaissance, it could be an across the beach operation, it could be special reconnaissance of a type. Uh, but those, they specialize in that, and it takes an awful lot of training to be very good at those underwater operations. They're highly choreographed uh, uh, clan, clandestine underwater operations. So normally how many men are there in a SEAL team? You know, it can vary. I think you have a small admin segment that can be up to 30 to 40 people, and you have your platoon SEALs in those platoons, which can be 96 to 100. And what are the basics that you have to be able to do? Like, how much swimming do you have to be able to do? Well, I, I don't know the parameters, but you have to be... You, SEALs are generalists for the most part, except maybe when they get into specialized missions like the one we were talking about. But they have to be good in the water. They have to be able to function on land. They have to maintain their parachute skills. So there's an awful lot of training to keep those skills current. So a, a team that's back, that's not deployed, will go through its workup and they will do combat swimmer attacks, ship attack, harbor penetrations. They will go through their airborne training. They will do lots and lots of land warfare training. They'll maybe uh, fast rope or rappel onto oil rigs or onto ships to be prepared for those contingencies. And then typically they'll go to Afghanistan and do nothing but land warfare operations in the mountains. So what about the, the kind of things that a SEAL has to do in order to be approved during BUDS? Do you have to stay underwater for a certain length of time? Well, they have various things. Uh, a lot of times they will, uh, I remember from my SEAL training, we had to swim down 50 feet and tie three knots, which is, if you practice at it, it's not that hard. They, some of them will have as much as uh, uh, 50 meters that they have to swim underwater. Okay, so there's certain things they have to do. They'll have certain open water swim times, three, five, seven mile swim in open water with fins in a certain period of time. So there are water requirements and then they have their drown proofing, which is very difficult. Uh, they tie your hands behind your back and your feet together and you have to go out there in the pool for a period of time and stay afloat. Anybody ever drowned in training? It, there have been some drowning issues that, that more have to do with hypothermia than drowning, but they, they're, this train is very highly supervised, and I, I think I do recall an incident of a drowning in a pool, but it's been quite a while. What about running? How much do you, do you have to put 50 pounds on your back and run yeah. certain distance? They have certain runs every day. They're out running on the beach or in various situations. Uh, they have certain timed runs. You know, you have to have run a certain distance in a certain amount of time. Uh, I do recall that part of, running is a part of it. If I was going to tell a young man, should I be a good runner or a good swimmer, I'd be a good, they'll teach you how to swim. I'd be a good runner. So what about jumping out of airplanes? Well, that's a very, uh, that's just, uh, another skill set. It's uh, not for the faint of heart, perhaps, but uh, a lot of our military people jump out of airplanes, including Navy SEALs. It's just, uh, uh, it's a very formatted, very structured, and a very safe evolution. What does it do to an organization like the SEALs after this recent uh, Osama bin Laden killing? Well, it's, uh, uh, the media hopefully will die down and things will go back to normal and they'll go back to doing their jobs and the team that was tasked with this will be tasked with something else. Uh, as far as any recruiting aspects, obviously this type of thing will probably help recruiting. There'll be a few young men who think, you know, I think I'm going to give that a try or that's what I want to do. Uh, right now, the, there was a period of time where the SEALs were having a hard time finding recruits. They weren't getting as many people as they needed because they were uh, modestly trying to expand the force, but very recently they've not had a lot of problem with that. They're getting a lot of fine young men who want to be Navy SEALs. Have you been able to watch training over the years? I have. I wrote a book called The Warrior Elite. Now granted this was 10 years ago in 1990. Uh, it came out in uh, 2001, but I was allowed to walk with a class start to finish. It was almost like going back to, like when you were a lieutenant junior grade, you, you got to go back to OCS and do all this again. Uh, I was with class 228 start to finish uh, uh, and I wrote a book called The Warrior Elite and it was really 
uh, very personally satisfying to go back and be with them every step of the way through their buds training. How much of your writings has to be cleared by either the SEALs or the Defense Department? Pretty much all of it, and it's generally service component. If I'm writing, if I'm with Army Special Forces, it goes through uh, uh, the Army Special Forces Command and uh, the, the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. Uh, I was just finished a book with the 75th Ranger Regiment, which will go through the U.S. Army Special Operations Command. But typically, they uh, in my last SEAL book, the Sheriff of Ramadi was with was vetted very closely because it was operational details with the uh, Naval Special Warfare Command. And uh, I typically have no problem with this. They're very helpful, uh, and I tend to, at this stage of the game, know what's appropriate to write about and what is not. Does that give you, I mean, does that bother you that you can't just write something and publish it? Uh, not really. Uh, I am afforded a lot of trust to be allowed to go into these training venues and be among these people and to have the access I do, nobody else does. And I will never violate that trust, so I'm very careful about what I write about and what I talk about. Have you ever written, I mean, can you write, write stuff in your uh, novels that you don't have to have approved? Yes, but it's it will not relate to any, it, it won't be a ghosting shadow of, a, of an operation that say, wait a minute, he's writing about this operation here. Now, the things in my novels are uh, totally fictitious, and uh, I don't think there's any attribution there at all. One young man who's deceased and was killed, Mike Murphy, has yes. been honored uh, Medal of Honor. Yes. Uh, did you know him? Did you I know did him? not know him. I was privileged to write a forward for the book uh, Seal of Honor about Mike Murphy. What did what happened to him? Well, he was in a, a special operations team uh, where uh, three of them were killed. Uh, one of them, Marcus Luttrell, managed to survive the engagement. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Marcus Luttrell is was in the SEAL class I followed for the Hawaii Year Elite, so I happen to know him rather well. Uh, they got in a situation to where they uh, w uh, didn't have any support. There were an awful lot of Taliban around them, and they had a running fight for their lives, and they died in a very courageous stand, but they died fighting. What did you think of Marcos Luttrell's book? Uh, it was a uh, Difficult for me to read. I hate reading stories where you know the outcome. You know that uh, these men are going to die. Uh, I thought there was some very interesting, from an ethics perspective, of discussions that took place about when and when not to take life that I found uh, instructional, if nothing else. And then I think that uh, the issue of hospitality within the Muslim culture I found compelling because that's a lot of most of us in the West don't understand just what that means in the Muslim culture. If you offer somebody hospitality, that has to be honored. Is there a lot we don't know of what SEALs train for and what goes on behind the scenes? I think there are, but more on the operational level. I think the training is basic, hard, hard military training. I think the basic skill sets are universal to all Special Operations Command and all to the Army and Marine uh, conventional units as well. It's when you get into the actual operations and into the specialized tactics and procedures that it becomes classified. And if not classified with a security classification, it's sensitive. They don't want to talk about just exactly how they enter a room, what they do to get from one room to the next, and how they go about executing a mission. So if they said to you, we'd like to have you visit with some of the seals that went in on this mission and it'll all be top secret and you can't publish it but you could talk to them what were the questions you want to answer uh i think i would ask them i'm more interested in their personal stories what was going through your mind at what point did it say we're gonna they're not going to cancel this one we're going to go do it uh when you got on target what were some of the tactical uh how were your fire teams set up just the it, i have an interest in these things so what was going on on the ground that you were doing this? What was the resistance you met? Uh, what are your kind of recollections? Typically in an operation like this, something happens that is the, that we'll never know about that was kind of poignant or tragic and something maybe even humorous. Uh, when you got back to that bird and you lifted off out of there, what were you thinking about? You guys had to be had to be a tremendous emotional release. So it would relate to the things that go about that. I would love to talk to that assault commander because he had a lot on his plate. Uh, 
What rank would he have been? Uh, I am not sure. He would have been a lieutenant commander, perhaps a commander. He would have been senior. He would have been around for a while. Uh, I think that, uh, as I've always, I've, he had what we all have in a mission like that, three things. You've got to accomplish your mission. You've got a mission to do. Second thing is you've got to get your men on target and you've got to get off target. You want to get, get off target safely. So you have to take care of your men. And the third thing is you want to, uh, you've got to watch out for non-combatants. You, you'd like to get in and out of there, do your job, take care of your men, and not shoot anybody that doesn't have to be shot. From what you know, let's say there were 20 or 30 men mm -hmm. on the ground. Can they all hear the commander in their ear? I would think that in a, in a mission like this, yes, they can. And they operate in sections. You've got squads and fire teams, and they're operating somewhat independently and reporting back to the ground force commander. He's in a position where he tries to maintain a control of what's going on. He's also in touch with higher command, his support elements, and trying to keep some idea of the bigger picture so that he can respond. If something goes wrong over here, they've got resistance, there's a problem here, he can shift assets or do something. Uh, if they, if they, once they get into a target like this, they'll start looking out. Is somebody else going to approach them? Is there a force that might come in to interfere with what's going on? He has to be mindful of that as well. So he has a lot going on uh, because he's more responsible. He's not running from room to room uh, doing that type of work. If somebody were to buy one of your 14 books, basic uh, knowledge of SEALs, which one would you recommend? Of SEALs, I think that I'd have to, SEAL train is definitely the warrior elite. That's where I talk about it. And it's changed a little but not much. Operationally, what the SEALs did in the Battle of Ramadi was nothing short of magnificent. So the Sheriff of Ramadi is a very good feel for what SEALs do and what they have done in the global war on terror. Dick Couch. <laughs> Brian. Am I right? Yes. I don't want to do that one again. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. All right. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>for free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.